morning and welcome to worship at Deer Park United Methodist Church. We apologize for some of the technical difficulties we have been having this morning, but hopefully you are able to join us here on Facebook Live. Later on, you will be able to watch the service on YouTube uh, in a recorded format. This morning, it is a joy to worship with all of you, even though we are apart in person. By the gift of technology, we are able to worship together. I want to invite you to take some time this morning to put uh, there in the comments any prayer requests that you might have, joys or concerns that we can lift up later on in the service. If you remember, I want to invite you to check in on the Church Center app. Let us know you are here worshiping with us or drop a comment here on Facebook. And if you are a guest joining us today, welcome. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us. Now let us lift our hearts together in song. There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still In all of my ebb and flow Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing Keeps me singing as I go All my life was wrecked by sin and strife Discord filled my heart with pain Jesus swept across the broken streams Stirred the slumbering chords again Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes He leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, See his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. My faithful song to Peace. 
Good morning, church. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear God, uh, please fill this room with your Holy Spirit. For those watching online, have your Holy Spirit descend upon them as we join together our hearts and our voices in worship of you. Lord, as we go through the midst of this pandemic and this year, this couple of years that are uh, taxing and trying, and people struggle with all kinds of ailments and injuries and sicknesses and depression and other mental illnesses, we ask that you be with them. Give them your peace. Show them your love through us. And give the families of those struggling your strength and your love as well. Lord, we ask that you be with those who have COVID and have your healing upon them and give strength to their families. We also pray for Chuck Fuller, for Kate, for Bill Lehman, the family of Mary Miller, for Keith, for Teresa Irvin, for Scott, for Stuart, and for Kristen. May you be with them and those that care for them. Give them your strength and your healing so that they may be whole. And now, together, we join in the prayer that you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mark 1, 21 through 28. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the Saginaw and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their Saginaw a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, consoling him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they, that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Good morning, girls. How are y'all? Good. Good? Well, today I wanted to talk to you guys about one of the most important things we can talk about, and that's what Jesus calls us to do. What does Jesus call us to do? Like, does he want us to be mean to our neighbors or to push our neighbors down on the ground? Or we have to put in their meat in their head. No, we don't want to do that either. But what did you say? Love them. Oh, so Jesus wants us to love our neighbor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah? You guys are right. Jesus wants us to love our neighbor. And I have a question. Has your mommies or daddies or sisters ever gotten sick? I have on school day. Oh. Do you love your mommy and daddy, your sister, less when they're sick? <laughs> You no, that we don't love them less because they're sick. What about if someone is hurt? Um, Mr. Joel. Yeah. Um, I had a high fever a night, and it was before school day, and I didn't get to go to school. Oh no! And Charlie, did you take care of her? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, well, that's good. We are still called to love each other even when we're sick or hurt. What about when we're sad? Are we still supposed to love each other when we're sad? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, even if we're sick and we're tired or we're hurt or we're sad, you know, Jesus still loves us. And he tells us to still love those that are hurting and sick too, right? So when we have people that need our love, we should love them, not be mean, right? Yeah. So... You guys want to help me pray for those who are hurting and their families? Let's pray real quick together. Dear God, Dear God, we pray to you today. You pray to you today. For those who are hurt. Those are too hurt. Who are sick. Who are sick. Who are sick. Who are sad. Who are sad. sad. And the people. And the people. Who love them. Who who love them. them. Help us. Help us. us To understand. To understand. And love. Love. All of your people. All of your people. All of your people. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 (laughs) Well, thank you guys for joining us this week. We'll see you next Sunday, okay? Bye. Amen. This morning, as Pastor Kate is still away on her time for rest and spiritual renewal, we are joined by a guest preacher by the name of Reverend Bruce Wilson. Uh, Bruce is ordained in the United Church of Christ and is also a board-certified chaplain and mental health counselor. So this morning, let us receive the word as Bruce brings it to us. Hello, my name is the Reverend Bruce Wilson, Jr. I'm a minister in the United Church of Christ, a chaplain, and also a mental health therapist. Today's scripture finds us in an interesting place where we're sort of in that epiphany season where we're starting to discover exactly who Jesus is and how he came into being. And our scripture today comes from Mark. You heard it earlier, and I'm going to talk through it again. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he, he being Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. This was already unusual because being Jesus, we don't know yet if he was already primed to teach or if he was invited to teach. We just know that he was teaching. And there they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. In those days, the scribes would have said what they needed to say and then invited in other voices. And when they invited in other voices, they would be the ones listening to figure out how God's movement in the world was going. But Jesus was already doing something different. And immediately there was in the synagogue, their synagogue, a man who had an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It sounds like already that we understand that this person has some fear about who Jesus is and how Jesus might shut him out. But Jesus, in Jesus' form, rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. We already know that part of this was Jesus talking directly to the questioning spirit, asking the spirit to leave the person. And they were all amazed, so they, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching? Again, they were probably surprised because they were probably used to being invited to ask questions. Yet Jesus commanded, and with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And 
at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Mark 1, 21 through 28. And Jesus really started to become the one we know today, the one with authority and the one with love and the one with compassion. This season of Epiphany reminds us that we are in a place of post-birth, but not yet into the time of resurrection, or not even into the time of Lent, where we discover that Jesus is going to be betrayed and that his actions are going to be remembered through all time. It was unusual for Jesus to speak at the synagogue, especially in the way that he spoke. He engages us as one who commands instead of one who actively involves other voices. It was unusual because Jesus was a teacher, not a clergy person yet, or at least as far as we know. And we recognize that Jesus isn't in that time fighting what we would qualify as a demon, but he is stating his place in the life of things. One author, Matt Skinner, a professor of New Testament, said, When the spirit can't have influence, it does not hold power to have sway over people's lives. We often think of Jesus being the one who was able to do all sorts of things, all sorts of miracles, all sorts of teaching. And in this story, we have yet another Jesus, one who tells a spirit to stop holding authority over a life that is questioning, that is scared, that is full of sadness and fear and worry. But Jesus commands that spirit to go away, to be gone, to not hold power over that life anymore. When I first took a job as a professional chaplain for full time, I was given the assignment of mental health care. In that time of providing care, I came across a lot of terrified people. People who were scared that what they were experiencing or what they were facing was some sort of demonic possession, a possession that left them alienated from their families, a possession that left them leaving them feeling all sorts of worry, that they were never going to have a life that was free of the anger, of the sadness, of the pain that they felt through their life's challenges or their mental health challenges. I saw many times people who would think about the ways the church had alienated them through their mental illness, pastors who didn't understand that the person that they were facing weren't just facing a demonic possession, but they were facing a true mental health challenge or mental health illness. Their reports were always sad that in some ways that they were pushed away from their church and their community because of what happened. The idea of clean and unclean in this particular story stands out to me. One of the things that stands out to me is that there, if you've worked with the Jewish tradition at all, you realize that some of their statements of clean and unclean were about protection of community. The unclean spirit was one that was fearful, that was scared, that had a place that was trying to ask questions and worried that Jesus was going to ultimately reveal them as demonic, as no good, as a person of ill integrity. 
but what we know is that Jesus did something different. Jesus invited the Spirit into a place of knowing that they were loved and that they were cared for, and that in this care that even God was going to invite them to the table of communion. Jesus spoke with authority about this, not questioning the love of God for this person that was in front of them. We often see people in our streets and in our lives and even sometimes in our homes who are fearful and anxious because of what mental illness does to people. We even think about the challenges that the person with depression or anxiety faces. With schizophrenia or bipolar, sometimes the behaviors that the person exhibit can frighten us and terrify us. But we also know that Jesus proclaims the love of all people. And we know that in this story, the person coming to the temple, seeing that Jesus was in a different way, giving us the authority of God, not leaving room for questions, but explicitly stating that love was the ruler of the day. Jesus, in his loveliness, in his wholeness of who he was, was giving to the folks that day a clear sense that Jesus wanted people to know his love and to know that the fear and the anxiety that the people facing mental challenges and the people facing those living with mental challenges did not have to fear. Jesus was not coming to destroy. Jesus was coming to reconcile. Jesus was coming to love. Jesus was speaking with the authority of love. There are a lot of people in the world who face challenges, some of which we know nothing about. Our current political climate, our current church, environment, even our current way of being with ourself, sometimes is a lot. And in that, some of us find ourselves fearing. We find ourselves anxious that if we truly revealed who we are and who we want to be with the world, that there will be judgment and there will be a deeming of we are unclean, or we are people who somehow love. And yet in this time of epiphany, we hear Jesus saying, come out of there. Come out of that place of fear. Come out of that place of unknowing. Come out of that place of scarcity and know God's love and God's goodness. I'm now almost nine years into chaplain and mental health work, and I'm often struck by where Jesus' role gets placed in the mental health work. A lot of times I hear the world and its attempts to fix, think Jesus' place is to fix they think Jesus' place is to heal, but not in a healing fashion, in a fixing fashion. They want Jesus to be a person who, rather than says, come out of there, you, it's okay, I'm here. You can experience God's love without fear. They want to say, have you thought about prayer for that? Have you thought about reading scripture for that? And sometimes in that place, people find a great deal of meaning in prayer, and they find a great deal of meaning in scripture. But ultimately, and most times, people find a lacking there. They don't see the connection between what's going on in their lives and the gospel 
And we, as people of faith, need to focus on the overarching theme that Jesus points here today. Be present. Proclaim God's love. And don't have to worry about anything else. We don't have to worry about anything else because your presence through Jesus is enough. Even your presence without Jesus' love is enough. But with Jesus' presence, it adds so much more because we can proclaim in that presence God's love and God's assurance and God's grace for all who come to us. I'll have to confess that the first time I ended up on a mental health unit, I was scared. I was nervous. I was worried that people were going to come to me and want me to do what their pastors did. Assure them of some certain scripture. Give them some sort of proclamation that this was exactly why they were going to face healing. And get better from this. As I grew in my ministry and in my faith, I began to recognize that people wanted to be seen and they wanted to be heard and they wanted to be loved. This is today's story of Jesus. This is how it plays into our lives. Jesus was not being cruel to the person or trying to somehow form an exorcism like most folks would say. Jesus was speaking truth to the heart of the matter. There is love. You are deserving of it. Come out of there. Get rid of the fear. Hold space that in some ways we are given the exact example of what unconditional love is in this story. I know many people in this world face fear of judgment, of lack of unconditional love, of so many things in our lives that are deemed as not good. And Jesus in this story highlights all of the compassion that God offers. In the Wesleyan tradition, they would say all of the grace God offers. And more and more I find meaning in that word. As we think about our time of epiphany, recognizing who Jesus is and recognizing what his role was in the world, his role was one of recognizing people, of seeing them truly, of understanding their pain and their suffering. Jesus got people's emotional and mental health like no other. He saw right through the facade. He saw right through our cultural concerns. And he invited people into a time of love. I find it interesting that the story of Mark says nothing of what happened to the Spirit. But it does say about the awe that people were in because of it. I can't think of a better way of God to reveal God's message than through a Savior who shows themselves to be full of love. Even if it's countercultural, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it takes the fear we experience as human beings and lessens it. Wow, what a story of grace. What a story of love. What a story of compassion. This story makes me wonder what you're going to do to drop your fear, to speak with the authority of God's love, to remind people whatever they may present themselves as, that they are loved through God.
through the example of Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit. They are loved. I find myself more hopeful with this message. I find myself knowing that Jesus was not coming at us with authority as authoritarian, but he was coming at us with the authority of the message of love, with the authority that we did not need to be fearful of folks who look different, who act different, who present different, but he came at us with the authority of love. Most of us are used to embracing the idea of seeing people with mental health challenges out on the streets. You've probably been downtown, either in Houston or other places, where you've seen people who live outwardly the challenge of mental illness. But some of us may have had the experience of experiencing it in our church and even in our homes. We are all too familiar with the person in our lives who speaks at maybe times that might be socially awkward. They may even have a message for us that does not come at the most appropriate time. In fact, they may even start talking with grandiose thoughts. It is not our job nor our place nor do I think Jesus' job, nor Jesus' place to say, wow, there's really something wrong with you. But it is our job, as Jesus taught us today in the story, to speak truth with love. Come out of there. There's help for you. There's love for you. There's God Almighty's love and affection waiting for you. You do not have to look like this. We are inviting you into life abundantly. And for our message today, I encourage you to think about all of those people in your life who may struggle with depression or anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, personality disorders. Invite them into the love that Jesus invites us in this story today. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Find me in the river Find me on my knees I've walked against the water Now I'm waiting if you please We've longed to see the roses But never felt the thorns And bought our pretty crowns But never paid the price Find me in the river, find me there Find me on my knees with my soul made bare Even though you're gone and I'm cracked and dry Find me in the river, I'm waiting here Find me in the river Find me on my knees I've walked against the water Now I'm waiting if you please We didn't count on suffering We didn't count on pain but if the blessing's in the valley 
Then in the river I will wait Find me in the river Find me there Find me on my knees With my soul laid bare Even though you're gone And I'm cracked and dry Find me in the river I'm waiting here Find me in the river Find me there Find me on my knees With my soul laid bare Even though you're gone And I'm cracked and dry Find me in the river I'm waiting here for you Find me in the river I'm waiting here for you This week, I want to invite you to take some time to stop and reflect over the things that are happening in your life and to listen for the place that God and Jesus is calling you to step out of fear and to step into this life that we are invited into. And if you or a friend or a loved one you know is, is living life with someone uh, who struggles with their own mental illness or mental health challenges, I want to invite you to consider how you might speak in love to their life, how you might be present with them, and instead of trying to fix them, as we heard, how you might live in a life of love with them. This week, one of the many ways that we are invited to participate in the life of this church to ensure that our ministry can continue on uh, with our community is by the giving of our tithes and offerings. There are a couple of ways that you can do that this week. You can either mail an offering to us or you can give online. You can find that link there on uh, dpumc.org. Um, but now, let us sing one more song as we worship together. And I searched the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise Treasures of faith Are never enough i 
Franciscan sisters. They were wonderful women, full of bravery and honesty. So I end today in honoring them with a benediction in the Franciscan tradition. May God bless you with discomfort, discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. Discomfort so that you will live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger, anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people. Anger so that you will work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears, tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, starvation, and war. Tears so that you will reach out to them and comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with foolishness, foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world, foolishness that you will do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. You turn grace into garden.